Beautiful. Ladies, I want to welcome you again, welcome you to our class and to this new study. Uh, I am Sherelle Warren, your teaching leader for this class, and I do have just a few announcements for you, okay? So, if you are a registered adult bringing a child, you must attend class whenever your children attend the children's program, okay? We can't have you drop your children off, <laughs> run errands. <laughs> All right, so just wanted to put that information out there. Praise the Lord. All right. In case of an emergency, here's another one. In case of an emergency, the children program follows the first Baptist Church emergency procedures for evacuation and tornado drills. Emergency exit maps are placed in each children's room for workers and volunteers, okay? I just wanted to inform you you all of that. Okay, so your discussion groups will be, uh, have, they will have a schedule and they'll be asked to volunteer in the children's area. I want you to remember that this is a blessing and it's a privilege. And so when the opportunity comes for your discussion group to volunteer in the children's area, you will get to serve together in the children's program. You can sign up at that time with your group leader, okay? That is it for the announcements today. They were all about our beautiful children, praise God. Okay, ladies, um, the outline will be up for a few minutes. Feel free to write that down. Remember that it'll also be up on the website. Okay, and on my YouTube channel, there's also the outline there as well. Um, our opening prayer, let's pray, ladies, amen. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord. We thank you that you are here with us today, Lord, that your presence can be felt, Lord. We give you all praise and honor, Lord, because we know you're the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. There is no other God above you. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that you allow us, if we want to accept you, Lord, to have faith in you and have a saving life through, um, through only our faith in you, Lord. You just alone saves, saves us, Lord. And so we are just so grateful for that. Lord, I just do ask for a pricking for the hearts of anyone who is in our class who doesn't know you in the pardon of their sins. They haven't accepted you as Lord of their life. That you would prick their heart today that they would come and desire to accept you and to know you so that they can be forgiven in the pardon of their sins and have eternal life with you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, ladies. We will go ahead and get into it, get into this lecture. It was so funny when I was preparing for the lecture this uh, last week, I was thinking to myself, you know, what would really make us think about the importance of creation? And not all of us, but many of us in the room are, are mothers. And so uh, when we were getting ready to have our children, we were so excited for, for many of us, and we wanted to make sure that we had planned for our children, prepared the nursery, had the right doctor, the right pediatrician. We went through a lot of planning. And we felt that this child was going to be a what? A blessing to us because we knew that this was special. This was something that was going to come forth, be a part of our family. And it just reminds me that in the creation story, God created us, what? In his very own, what? Image, right? And he created, what? Male and female, right? And so, it is just, it would not be good for us to not focus on the fact that our God, the creator, had a plan. He had a purpose in mind, right? When he created us, just like we have a plan most of the time for our children, we have a purpose in mind, right? So these are just some of the things I want you to think about. When we had our leaders launch, we had uh, some training time. And one of the things that we did for an icebreaker was that I had a 
a, um, I guess what you call an instant cam, right? And I took pictures of the leaders as they came in. And then I gave them that picture. And when they worked with their partner, they were able to exchange the image of themselves, right? And we wanted to give them the framework to be looking at the image of their, their, their partner, right? And that was through what? The image of God, right? And so we wanted them to look at what things that they had in common. And they were able to focus on so many things that they had in common that when I pointed out the differences, they had spent all their energy on the things that they had in common, right? Because they were looking at their sisters through what? The image of God. So it's a great reference point for us. God's purpose, God's word, God's people, and God's plan. So why did God create us? It was for an ultimate purpose in revealing himself to us, right? We were created for something bigger than ourselves, right? And so you can start to think about why is the reason that I exist? What is my purpose? What is my plan? Amen. Mm. In Genesis, God tells his story from what? The beginning, right? And the purpose was to record God's creation of the world. His desire to have a people set apart to what? Worship him, right? Amen. He didn't create us to worship our kids, to worship material items, right? Worship titles. That's not why he created us. He created us to worship him. The original audience of Genesis was the people of Israel. We're going to be focusing on two divisions today. God established, one, God established Israel as his chosen people. And our second division is Israel's story reveals God's faithfulness despite human failure. Amen. So God's ultimate purpose was what? For us to reflect his image, right? his person, his desires, to have people set apart again to worship him. What does this tell us about our ultimate purpose? If we are to reflect, be reflective mirrors radiating God's character, how does that change our attitude towards what we do? So in Genesis 1:27, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them Male and what? Female. Amen. God delighted to be worshipped. He created so that he would be glorified. Genesis sets the stage for the entire Bible. It reveals the person and the nature of God. God values human beings because he created them in his very own image. Does he, eval does he value some human beings? Mm -mm. Right? He values what? All human beings, right? Okay. So he wants to use us in this world today like he desired to use the Israelites in biblical times. God had a plan and a purpose for his creation, and he has a plan and purpose for us now. God values human beings because we were made in his image. He wants to save us by grace so that we can be used in this world. However, rebellion by the people of Israel and the people today are similar. It's tragic and the consequences of sin separate people from God. In your lesson this week, and you would have covered it in your discussion groups, there was a question, and I think it was on, I think it may have been second day, don't quote me, less uh, on the question number 5A. And it had you answer creation, right, which is what we just talked about. Somebody's yarning too much. I'm like, okay, am I making y'all sleepy? I don't want to make y'all sleepy. I want y'all to wake up because this is good. Amen. Amen. Rebellion, okay? So that was the next part of it, right? So we know that the rebellion part comes when what? Adam and Eve sinned against God and brought sin curses, not just on themselves, but what? For every person born since, right? 
And then the next part of that was the redemption, right? God immediately initiated a plan to redeem humankind from its sinful state. Jesus, amen. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus. Remember Jesus in Matthew as we saw him? Amen. Restoration was the next part. It says people who trust in Christ for salvation, right, enjoy a restored relationship. So the believers are us, right, because we trust in Christ and we get to have a what? A restored relationship with God, right? And this life here and what? Looking toward the eternal fellowship, right? When we won't see any remnant of sin, we're going to get a new body, not these old crackety knees that we hear today. Amen. Amen. Praise God. So I kind of wanted to just give you all that as a framework, right? And what I hope we learned today, and I didn't, did I not say our aim? Okay, she's got it up. Amen. Amen. What I hope we learned today is that Israel's story matters to believers today. What I hope we learned today is that Israel's story matters to believers today. We live today as they lived in a divided kingdom, right? In a broken world where people choose idols. I bet if you were to look over your own life, you'd see some idols, some altars that you built in your life. But God wants you to wipe all those clean, right? Because he wants us to look to him, right? All right. As you study God's word, remember the creation and redemption of mankind serves to accomplish God's ultimate and final purpose. Remember Jesus will forever reign over his redeemed people and a, in a new heaven and a new earth. Our doctrine today is humanity, creation, and purpose. God has created every person, as we've talked about, in his image with a unique design for humanity, for eternal fellowship with him. Human intellect, a sense of something more, a longing for deeper meaning, and life give evidence of a hole in the human heart that only God could fill. All humanity fell into sin when Adam broke fellowship with God. This represents the greatest tragedy known to us. However, God's active plan to redeem sinners and restore intimate fellowship with him throughout Christ, through Christ, represents our greatest hope and privilege. In order for us to flourish, it requires us to be in right relationship with our creator. Nothing compares with knowing God, walking with him, and experiencing his mercy and love. When I was looking at that, it made me think about when we are right in right fellowship with our husbands. For those of us who are married, when we are in right fellowship with our husbands, we have an intimacy with them. And so God designed that. But I love that we are able to think about that. Maybe that would be something that you go home and think about, that it's important that we have that intimacy with our husbands for those of us who are married. The benefit of knowing God are meant to experience, to be experienced in this life, okay? So not just in eternity. For some of us, when we take a look at the Lord's Prayer, I'm going to pull up the Lord's Prayer, and I just want to read a little bit of it. The Lord's Prayer is in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 through 13. It says, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. So that means we get to enjoy some of these, what, rewards right here on earth, right? Amen. Your highest purpose in life can only be experienced when you surrender your life to God and yield yourself to him. His plan, not your plan. So let's read in Ephesians 1. I'm going to take you to Ephesians 1, 11 through 14. It says, in him 
we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with, per, with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is the deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Amen. So when you say to yourself, when I don't believe that only God can give my life purpose, I'm hopeless, trying to find hope and happiness and insufficient pleasures of this world. I experience only temporary excitement and end up settling for less than God's best. But now, when I believe that only my creator can help me be what he created me to be, I seek God completely surrendering all. God's purpose for me uh, do not require easy circumstances, right? I'm a testament of that, right? God's purpose for me, this ain't easy, but he's got it. Amen. His presence and power overflow in my life daily in all areas, right? My activities, mm, and it gives me hope for eternity. In God alone, my heart finds a home. I can influence people with the word of God, and that word of God in me, it changes what? My actions and my behavior, right? So then I'm not like the YouTube influencers, right? Hey, I'm influencing for Jesus, right? Amen. That's the image. Remember we're talking about we're walking in the image of God. He created us in his image, right? Amen. Think about real life application. What it looks like in our everyday life. Be specific. Ask God to reveal himself to you. God's purpose for your life, it matters. Have you experienced at some point in your life a desire to figure out what really matters? When have you had an experience with God? Think about it. I'm telling you, when you have an experience with him, you don't want to be away from him, honey, when he gets a hold of you. How has God gradually and lovingly drawn you to find lasting pleasure and purpose in knowing him? Many things compete for our loyalty and focus, yet fall short of offering purpose for our lives. In our world today, we have seen people become loyal to institutions, political parties, and racial uprisings, right? They have placed all these causes, what, before God? No. Our God is a God of justice, but he is also a jealous God, and he desires to have your whole heart. Amen. We should put nothing above our relationship with God. And in doing this, we can see his grace and mercies all over our life. How do spiritual disciplines, like the Bible study you're attending, prayer, keep you focused on the things that matter? As we enter this new study this year, we will have to trust God to maintain our focus for a deeper purpose that he has for us. Only God can feed our souls and give our life purpose. Do you expect God to speak to you through every lesson? I do. Do you anticipate his presence every time you open his word? Absolutely. How will you relate what you are learning with your innermost yearnings to know God and to walk with him? There are people in, that you have in the sphere of your influence, right? And for some of us, it may just be our children. That may be the people in our sphere of influence. But those are the people that God is giving you influence on, and those are the people that you should be teaching to walk through God's word and to draw closer to him. All right?
How does this outlook uplift and help keep you committed to those he has called you to care for, right? And we know that the church is not what? Four walls, right? The church is beyond the four walls, right? Amen. But we are so grateful for the local church. Now, God established Israel as his chosen people. As we look at the story of Abraham and the Abrahamic covenant, God had a purpose to the nation uh, for the nation of, uh, of Abraham, right? We see the beginning of God's covenant people and the far-reaching links of his salvation plan. Salvation comes by faith. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. That's Hebrews 11.1. 1. Abraham's descendants will be God's people and the savior of the world will come through the chosen nation. The promise of God was the same then and the same today. In Genesis 12, uh, verses 2 through 3, it says, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all people on earth will be blessed through you. All right? In a world that has grown dark, God's people are the light of the world. We do not have to be hopeless. We can look to the Bible, which tells us about the restoration of all things. This is a hope for all of us in trouble and a troubling world. Redemption, God immediately initiated that plan. Remember we talked about that, to redeem mankind from a sinful state. He sent his own son taking on human form. That's what we were studying in Matthew, right? So that he could die on behalf of sinners. But Jesus was raised back to life, right? Came back from the dead, defeating sin and death for all who put their faith in him. People who trust in Christ for salvation enjoy, enjoy a restored relationship with God in this life and look forward to eternal worship set free from sin. World history and the Bible story move forward toward a glorious day when God will restore what sin has destroyed. Jesus will return on earth and bring judgment on Satan and those who have rejected and refused his gift of salvation. Come to the Father today. Our first principle is God's choice of and plan for Israel reveals his faithfulness and sovereignty. Israel experienced God's highest purpose as a nation when they obeyed and submitted to God. In the same way, God's best for every person he has created can only be found in fellowship and surrender to him. The Bible reveals God's eternal plan for redeem, to redeem his people from sin's curses and lead them to unbroken fellowship with him. In our Division II, Israel's story reveals God's faithfulness despite human failure. God's promise to Abraham and through him to us are defined by God's character and gracious actions. His promises are without preconditions and something that God guarantees. How does knowing this become a comfort and assurance for you? Israel was chosen by God to reveal God to the world, and he entrusted his word to the Israelites so that they could teach the future generations. That's what we should be doing, teaching the future generations. God's plan for Israel includes receiving and proclaiming his word. They are given the law that God, for, of God to, dis, to demonstrate and proclaim the truth of God. Okay, so work with me and pray for me with these words. The Mosaic law was given to the people delivered from bondage to reveal to them how they should respond in gratitude, trust, and worship. During the time before Israel entered the land God promised in another covenant God made with the Israelites, this one we call the Moazic, prayerfully. Now, this one was different from the Abrahamic covenant because it was conditional. 
the Israelites were commanded to keep the law God had given them. If they did, God would allow them to flourish in the land. If they did not, God would take them from the land. Israel flourished when they were in line with God's purpose for them, right? God's purpose for everyone is to have fellowship with him. That is how we flourish, in fellowship and in submission to God. The Israelites flourished when they submitted to God's purpose for them. Ultimately, the next part of their story should serve as a lesson for us. God deserves our total submission. Amen. Okay, although the Israelites were rebellious, as we are rebellious today, instead of giving them what they deserved, he drawed near to them, all right, when they cried out to him. He listened to them, and he sends people called judges to help them in their oppression, all the time drawing Israel back to himself, and he is doing the same for us today. There's the rescue of the Israels by judges, and in Judges, you can look through, I think it's uh, chapter 3, verse 7 through uh, 16, chapter 16, verse 31, along with many judges of Israel. I want you to look this up on your own. There was a woman, and her name was Deborah. This woman's name, as I said, was Deborah, and she was one of the, their leaders, okay? She had a position of authority. She was an exceptional woman. She was a judge, a warrior, and a poet. I'm not going to be able to dig deeper into Deborah, but her story is amazing, and it would be really good for you to dig deeper on your own, all right? She worked alongside a military uh, general. One of the things that I want to point out about this lady, of Deborah, this judge, that could make us think about ourselves and to take something with us is that it's important for us to be obedient. She was obedient, right? If God is telling you to do something, if he's telling you to go somewhere, despite your fears, listen to him, right? He has a plan, and we can, be, we can begin to understand when we let our hearts open to what he wants to do and how he wants to change us. I want to also tell you in her story, it's leaving us with being courageous, okay? Remember that God doesn't call the qualified, right? He qualifies the call. Amen. Doing something out of your comfort zone to glorify him, even though it's terrifying to you, it requires faith. And he never promised it was going to be easy. Be bold. Be courageous for his glory. Stand for God. Never waver in your faith. We may not always know what the road ahead will look like, but we only need to remember that God will faithfully guide us and lead the way. And that's what the Israelites could have done. They could have let God lead them and let God guide them, and he was going to lead the way. Our second principle, God's faithfulness to Israel reveals his redemptive heart towards humanity. As we look at Israel's story at the end of the reign of King Solomon, we will see through Israel's history how God would redeem the nation and redeem the world. Solomon has died and his son, Rehoboam, has become king. Now, let's recall God's words to Solomon before his death in response to his sin and idolatry. God told Solomon he would tear the kingdom away from the hand of his son and give him one tribe and that's exactly what happened to Solomon's son, Rehoboam. One of Solomon's officials was a man named Jeroboam. Okay, it's going to be difficult. Jeroboam, I don't know. We're going to just go keep going. From the tribe of Ephraim. God has told him that through a prophet named Ahiah, Ahijah, that he would be given ten of the tribes of Israel. He was made king of Israel, excluding the tribes of Judah and Benjamin. Jehoram 
began his rule by turning the people of Israel away from God. He set up two golden calves and appointed priests in the city of Bethel. He told the people that the golden calves were their gods who brought them out of Egypt. This was a complete and total rejection of God. And this started the divided nation of Israel with him ruling over the 10 tribes, the northern kingdom, and then Rehoboam ruling over Judah and Benjamin, the southern kingdom. Throughout the rest of the divided kingdom, Jehoram, you're just going to have to pray, y'all. Ten tribes were referred to as Israel and Rehoboam, two tribes, were known as Judah. And throughout this part of Israel history, we see the nations divided into these two kingdoms, right? And this is a dark time in Israel's history. Many kings came after Jerohamim and Rahabam, and some continued in the ways of the kings before them and idol worship moving further and further away from God, but some directed the people back to God. The importance is, is that you're studying this word. In your lesson, in that book, you've got everything. You can look these words up for yourself, okay? God is going to use us if he allows us, whether we can pronounce those words or not. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Your authenticity may be different. This is my authenticity. Hallelujah. Yet, through all of this, we see God showing his faithfulness and patience to his chosen nation. The people of Israel and the people of Judah consistently broke the Moasic covenant with God. They rebelled against God many times, but God is faithful even when we are not. Thank the Lord. God revealed himself yet again and again through the prophets to warn both kingdoms that would, what would happen if they continued in their sin and to call them back to God. This warning should be a warning for us today. Stop playing with God because he ain't playing with you. Now let's take a closer look. A prophet, this is it, we're wrapping it up. A prophet is a person commissioned by God to proclaim God's word. The prophets were called by God, received God's word, and then proclaimed the word. This is important because they were not speaking for themselves. They were speaking for God, right? But when God uses even us, he doesn't take away our style. He doesn't take away our culture, right? He doesn't take away our interests, okay? But these people were not speaking for themselves. They were, God was using them. They were speaking for God. And many times these prophets were not accepted. Their warnings came to people who did not want to turn back to God. And some were chased down and killed for their message. Mm, they brought to the people. Some performed great miracles on behalf of God, but many times they were simply ignored. The prophet spoke to the people on behalf of God to help the people see their sin, to communicate the impending consequences and to urge them to turn from their sin back to God. As I leave you all today, and as we leave today, please remember one of God's attributes from this passage this week is that God is what? He's faithful. God knows and loves each of his own. He will do all he has promised. He will care for and make strong, forgive, make new, protect, purify. From the beginning, he has had a plan, a plan to restore the world that sin broke. God is faithful to his own plan. We know God is faithful because we, he sent his son on the cross to die for our sins. All right? Nothing can separate God's people from his love. He is faithful to himself and faithful to his word. We can trust him to keep his promises. So 
Go and influence the world in the name of Jesus Christ. Let me pray, ladies. Thank you, Lord. We are so grateful. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you for your faithfulness. Mm. Thank, thank you how we don't have to have it together, Lord. We don't even have to, we don't even have to have anything, Lord. All we need is you. So, Lord, I thank you for your presence. I thank you for these ladies that you have brought to study your word, Lord. Let your word reveal to them the things that you want them to know. Let them be so careful to give you all the praise and all the honor and all the glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.